Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Family Research Council headquarters here in Washington, D.C. I want to thank you for joining us for the 2016 State of the Family Address. A little over a year ago, we held the same event, but on that day, it was on the Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I believe that time was very fitting because that national holiday honors civil rights and testifies to the importance of religion in American life. On that occasion, we sought to remind Americans, as Dr. King did so powerfully through his words and deeds, that through the power of faith, we aim to, quote, transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood, end quote. Now, last year's address came at a time of great anxiety in our nation. We knew that the challenges that lay ahead of us 2015 would bring a momentous decision on the constitutionality of marriage. As we prepared for this event a year ago, Islamic extremists mounted a devastating attack on the editorial offices of Charlie Hebdo and days later killed four French Jews at a kosher market in Paris. Attacks that only foreshadowed the wave of terrorism to come which hit our country just weeks ago. What came to pass in 2014 has literally challenged us to the core. The Supreme Court dismissed the natural and universal meaning of marriage as a violation of the 14th Amendment and as an assault on human dignity. The national debt soared above $18 trillion. This averages about 58, over $58,000 for every man, woman, and child in America. Under Obamacare, millions of Americans are now dependent upon government subsidies for their health care insurance. The president's lack of faith in the market-based reform has created more reliance on government among Americans who need opportunity, not another government program. And by the way, a majority of the health care co-ops collapsed, saddled with unsustainable debt. The suffering of persecuted Christians, some 100 million worldwide, continue to grow. Meanwhile, the Obama administration continued to drag its feet, refusing bipartisan calls to label ISIS's murderous actions as nothing less than genocide. In November, I traveled with a group of fellow Americans to the Golan Heights and observed Israel's defensive strikes against the movement of Iranian war materials across Syria to Hezbollah. Iran is stepping up its provocations on the eve of receiving billions of dollars released by President Obama's reckless nuclear deal. Meanwhile, the Obama administration once again showcased its misguided priorities when they threatened to withhold federal funds if an Illinois high school did not open its girls' locker room and sports teams to a boy who now believes he's a girl. And last month, Aaron and Melissa Klein, the courageous couple who joined us in this very room last year, were compelled to pay over $136,000 to two women whom they could not in good conscience use their talent to create a wedding cake. However, in the midst of the sobering summary of 2015, there were many positive signs and countless acts of courage that should inspire us to make 2016 a turning point for our nation. Knowing that God is the Lord of the universe and the one in whose hand lies the destiny of all peoples and nations, that is where we find our hope. As our faith compels us to stand for God's unchanging truths, and when we do, our lives tell a compelling story to our fellow citizens that there is, in fact, a better way. In addition to our faith, we still 
in America tonight have our freedom. And we must use that freedom to choose the good and the true. That, after all, is the purpose of freedom. And many are doing just that, using their God-given constitutionally assured liberty to stand for faith, family, and freedom. We have seen several heroes arise in this last year, and we're honored to have several of them with us here tonight. While the marriage decision was a devastating principled loss for all of us, it was a very personal loss for Kentucky Clerk of Court Kim Davis. As Kim became the face of the opposition when she refused to sanction same-sex marriages by allowing her name to appear on marriage licenses, Kim stood strong to the point of spending time in a local jail until Matt Staver and our friends at Liberty Council successfully argued for her release. She has since received a religious accommodation by an executive order from the newly elected Governor Matt Bevan, who, by the way, made religious liberty a central theme in his successful campaign for mayor or for governor in Kentucky. Kim stood up courageously against the power of the state and the ACLU, and she, along with religious liberty in Kentucky, prevailed. Well done, Kim. We are honored to have you with us tonight. In November, after nearly an 18-month effort, voters in the nation's fourth largest city rose up against an ordinance that would have provided special rights to some based upon their sexual behavior and identity at the expense of others. The final vote in Houston was an overwhelming rejection of Mayor Parker's imposed ordinance with 61% voting in opposition, a landslide, a sign of where Americans stand on this nonsense. Tonight, we're honored to have with us Pastor Hernan Castano, the director of the Hispanic Church Development for the Houston Area Pastors Council. Pastor Castano, you were called one of the Houston Five because your sermons were subpoenaed by the mayor. Now, folks, this shows, by the way, just how out of touch the political elite really are. You don't need a subpoena to get a sermon. <laughs> there are thousands of pastors that would love for politicians to read their sermons. <laughs> but this was not about sermons nor biblical interpretations. This, my fellow Americans, was about political intimidation which has no place in our republic. Right. Pastor Castano, you rightfully resisted the tyrannical overreach of government, and we were proud to stand with you and the other pastors in Houston as was evidenced by the I Stand Sunday event there in Houston, Texas. And as a result, the citizens of Texas stood with you, and on November 3rd, you prevailed, and you defeated the agenda of the last. We welcome you here tonight to the Family Research Council. We're also honored tonight to have with us Pastor Charles Flowers, a senior pastor of Faith Outreach Ministries International in San Antonio, Texas. When the mayor and the city council passed a non-discrimination ordinance in San Antonio, forbidding anyone who objected to the LBG, LBGT agenda from serving in city government or even doing contract work with the city, you called hundreds of pastors and Christians together to expose the truth of the ordinance. Because of your voice and your leadership, Christians in San Antonio were awakened and a new mayor and new city council members were elected. And the transformation has been remarkable. In fact, the city council has essentially stopped the advance of Planned Parenthood through zoning laws and 
it's now the mayor's desire to instead fund a church-based pregnancy resource center. Also, the new mayor now asks the pastors in San Antonio for counsel and have, have them pray for her at her monthly gatherings. Thank you for standing, Pastor Flowers, and for helping transform San Antonio. <laughs> On the religious liberty front, last September brought a now familiar challenge. On this particular occasion, it was to Bossier City, a school district in my home state of Louisiana. When the airline high school principal, Jason Rowland, closed an email with the words, God bless you, and the Fellowship of Christian Athletes proposed placing prayer boxes around their school, the district came under attack from, yes, you guessed it, the ACLU. Fortunately, Principal Rowland contacted Mike Johnson, the Louisiana State Representative and an attorney with an allied organization, Freedom Guard. Mike offered free legal assistance to Jason and the school district to stand against the bullying of the ACLU. In response, their local community stood with them. They recently held a prayer rally organized by the community that attracted nearly 4,000 concerned citizens for the defense of religious freedom. The school board found the ACLU's claim to be, quote, without factual or legal basis and assured their commitment to protect the rights of all their students, including those who wish to engage in student-led, student-initiated religious expression. We're delighted tonight to have Principal Rowland and his wife with us, and we applaud them and the school board for displaying courage. And folks, I would encourage officials all across this country to follow their example and stand against this effort to def destroy our first freedom. Thank you for being here tonight. Another bright light in 2015 is the way the fight for life intensified as America became a more pro-life nation. For example, in recent weeks, North Carolina enacted a new law holding abortionists accountable to the state's existing 20-week ban. Now, this kind of accountability is encouraging and it's long overdue. But that's not all. In the last five years, over 280 pro-life laws have been enacted at the state level. That's remarkable. America is becoming a predominantly pro-life nation again. Now this past year, millions of Americans have had their stomachs turned and their minds changed by the appalling contents of the Planned Parenthood videos released by the Center for Medical Progress, pulling back the curtain of rhetoric that cloaks Planned Parenthood and their these videos show the callous and inhumane treatment of unborn children and the tactics used to deceive their mothers. Now, why the president vetoed a measure this past Friday that would have eliminated most of the federal funding going to Planned Parenthood, rest assured, we will not stop until this forced partnership between taxpayers and Planned Parenthood has ended. We have also seen renewed commitments in our churches in this battle for the sanctity of human life. There are now over 2,500 pregnancy care centers all across America providing hope and women to women and their unborn children. And there are a growing number of ministries working to end modern day slavery, human trafficking. Desperate to preserve its power, the far left now seeks to label all of its critics as extremists or haters and aggressively seeks to silence all who oppose its agenda. But we should take heart even from this. 
Our opponents seek to limit our freedom of speech because they fear its power. They seek to restrain the expression of our convictions because they're unsure of the truth of theirs. The freedom of expression is the very essence of liberty. But there can be no liberty in America without religious liberty. In our hearts, we know this to be true. <laughs> Refugees from dozens of countries are not seeking daily entry into America because they're fleeing freedom of speech. They're not looking to escape homelands where there's too much freedom of religion. They're not looking to a land where the right to life does not matter. They are fleeing the tyranny over their minds, their bodies, and their souls. Now, here in America, the stirrings are less overt but equally troubling. Anger, resentment, and fear appear to be among the prime political motivators today. Do we understand why this is happening? I believe America's founders would. They put in place the form of representative self-government that would distribute and balance the limited power that would belong to Washington, D.C. They designed a constitution that would keep most government close to the people and reserve much of the power to the people themselves. This structure would limit the concentration of power and restrain its exercise. But structure was not enough. It would fail if the people themselves did not practice restraint. They signed a declaration that states that our rights come from our creator and that the government's duty is to protect them, not lessen nor redefine them. And they believed that the best account of our personal and civic duties comes not from the whims of the political class, but from the transcendent truths of Scripture itself. As America's second president, John Adams, said, quote, Our system of government was made for a moral and a religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other, end quote. It's easy to see why we now sail such dangerous seas. Many of our nation's leading politicians and jurists believe that religion is a toxin in public life, something to be quarantined within the four walls of our churches. They want our culture stripped of the guidance of faith, the centrality of family, and the liberties that are our divine birthright. Not only will it be impermissible to publicly acknowledge the God who made us, it will be unlawful to act on our deepest understanding of him and his commandments. Acting on conscience will be a bar to public service. It will be a reason to be fined or fired. As 2016 begins, we can be sure, can we be sure that this year of decision will be a year of recovery. Unfortunately, we cannot. We can only be sure that it will be a year of determination. In the battle over basic convictions, as we see, the sidelines are shrinking. The field of contention is growing wider and deeper. Once again, we face times that try men's souls. And we must determine whether we will be sunshine patriots or men and women for all seasons. And we have t time tonight to sketch out but just a few proposals that can help America head in the right direction again and restore what has made America an evergreen nation. But they illustrate what we, the people, must do. Among the most important of these is racial reconciliation. Along with my friend and co-laborer, Bishop Harry Jackson, who I welcome here tonight. Welcome, Bishop Jackson. <laughs> this call to racial reconciliation has been central to the message of Family Research Council. 
Unlike some of the issues we face, I believe there is a broad middle ready and willing to work toward this goal. Sadly, the past few years have seen us beset by exploiters, politicians, political actors, and billionaire philanthropists who see in racial conflict a chance to advance their extreme political agendas. Now, a fair reading of American history constantly reminds us of the reality of racism and its continuing legacy. But a fair reading of the current events also shows the profound danger of exploiting the frustrations in, of the aggrieved and fueling disrespect for law enforcement. It is long past time, I believe, for our nation's religious leaders to come together and show our political leaders a way forward. Our blindness to the reality of the disintegration of the family and the dismissal of the role of our churches must also end. The promise of strong efforts these past seven years to restore fatherhood and reestablish family life in our poorest communities has faded completely. Instead, national policies have sown confusion about the very definition of family. President Obama has extolled the virtues of fatherhood even as he has fought for same-sex marriage. In essence, saying two same-gendered persons can parent as well as a mom and a dad. This contradictory message is more than disappointing. For our children throughout the country, it is devastating. It reduces mothers and fathers to genderless caregivers. Our children deserve better. They deserve a mom and a dad. And we pay a price for this incoherent ideological campaign by havoc in our homes and blood in our streets. That's why we have to re-empower American parents. The decision of our courts on contraception for minors, abortion on demand, and redefining marriage have gravely weakened the family. A religious liberty, both at home and abroad, must also be at center stage. The First Amendment Defense Act is a first and a vital step. This measure should not be necessary in a nation governed by constitutional principles. But those principles have been severely weakened, and Congress has a responsibility as a co-equal branch of government to make the meaning of the First Amendment plain and potent again. FADA, as the bill is called, would cement protections of the freedom of the free exercise of religious beliefs and moral convictions about marriage. Now, Family Research Council action, along with Heritage Action for America and the American Principles Project, have launched a presidential pledge to support the First Amendment Defense Act. And to date, six candidates, Ben Carson, Ted Cruz, Carly Fiorina, Mike Huckabee, Marco Rubio, and Rick Santorum have pledged, if elected, to present, if, and if presented to them, they will sign within the first 100 days of office the Freedom of Defense, the Freedom, the First Amendment Defense Act. They understand the urgency of this cause. Religious liberty in our military must continue to be defended. We cannot allow the freedom of religion our men and women are sworn to uphold to be denied them. Our own Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, who is with us tonight. General, thank you for behaving tonight. <laughs> We're honored to have this American hero as a part of our team and present here tonight. General Boykin, who was forced to withdraw from a West Point prayer breakfast because of the pressure from atheist groups, knows only too well the difficulties of living out one's faith in our increasingly politically correct military. Now, he has led the charge in this area 
an area in which we are now seeing even chaplains face opposition to their faith. This past year, Americans came to the defense of Navy Chaplain Wes Motter, who was targeted by his superiors for simply counseling on marriage and sexuality from a biblical perspective. We also saw the military court-martial Lance Corporal Manifa Sterling for refusing to take down Bible verses in her personal workspace. And we're continuing to work with our good friends at Liberty Institute to ensure she prevails in her case. And there was Army Chaplain Joe Lawhorn. He's another chaplain who faced repercussions merely for sharing how his faith strengthened him in the context of a discussion about suicide. The very purpose of military chaplains is to provide strength to our troops in the area of faith. If chaplains cannot speak of their faith, my friends, the situation is grave indeed. Additionally, religious liberty must become a priority again within our foreign policy. The history of the last century is clear. Totalitarians of every stripe have made suppression of all religious freedom or the liberty of some religions the target of their regimes. Especially dangerous are those who feed on religious hatred. We must promote and defend religious liberty as a human right for all faiths to be able to live freely wherever they are and whoever they are. Why? Because advocating for religious liberty lets the oppressed throughout the world know that they have a friend in America. And it sends a message to the terrorists and the tyrants as well. That knowledge bears long-term fruit for our own security. And frankly, it's simply the right thing to do for a nation whose na national motto is in God we trust. Religious liberty implies a commitment to human dignity. It is for this reason and many more that our nation's alliance with Israel must be renewed at its roots. The dignity of a people so long oppressed and persecuted merits America's concern and loyalty. It is time we once again as a nation that our government's rhetoric be matched by a resolve to stand with the Jewish state in a way that is both practical and principled, despite what the so-called international community might say. Of course, none of the goals we've discussed this evening will be reached without sacrifice, personally and corporately. We must work for our freedom as generations before us have done, sacrificing with our time, our tears, and our treasures to win the day. The past year has shown us that we cannot and will not be permitted to separate ourselves and watch while the contending cultures of life and death struggle for supremacy. Faith and reason, justice and mercy compel our presence in our nation's hour of need. I call upon all Americans, especially those who have a faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, to pray, organize, donate, speak to your neighbors, proclaim truth and your views boldly. We must do all of these things, and when that time comes in 10 months, make what Dr. King called that little walk to the voting booth. And in all of this, we must do, as William Wilberforce said, as he was in the heat of his battle, we must be souls of prayer, asking God for his forgiveness for our heavy faults and asking him for strength for our heavy task. And when we are done, May our children and our children's children know that as for us and our houses, we served the Lord. Amen. Thank you for being with us. God bless you.
and good night.